Good evening. Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, as Marcel said, it's somewhat of a tradition. Two times is a tradition. That's small, uh, small data sets and prediction. So we'll see next year. But it's a, an, an immense pleasure and an honor to welcome you tonight uh, to EPFL. I know you had already a busy day. Um, to, tonight is more of, uh, you know, larger theme uh, talks and, of course, finishing with uh, the legendary Edward Snowden. I think Applied Machine Learning Days is one of the lighthouse events at EPFL. We're very proud to have uh, Marcel Salaté and his team run this show every year. And I'm going to start, actually, by thanking Marcel and his team. It always takes some visionary professor uh, usually somebody that is very original and doesn't really fit exactly the mold of, you know, what a regular EPFL professor is, and Marcel is one of these, and it takes a very dedicated team around a visionary professor. I, I would like to thank Marcel very much for this. Okay, so I guess my job description is that I'm the chief concierge of EPFL, so I have to give you some numbers about, you know, numbers of kilometers of cleaning and so on. So the EPFL is a medium-sized institute of technology, one of two in Switzerland. Uh, our older sister, you probably know, is on the other side of Switzerland. We have about 11,000 students, 350 professors, and one Marcel Salate. Okay, that's sort of uh, how I can introduce EPFL. Um, okay, so uh, let me actually come to a few words about the topic. I won't be long because first, there are much more uh, expert people after me, and so I don't want to take too much time, and Bach is waiting, and you never have Bach waiting. Uh, and if this thing actually works, I can even show you. Well, it has an on button. It's a digital device. It can have two positions. And maybe the second position will actually work. Doesn't look like it will. So, okay, technology. Okay, is there another <laughs> device to actually change the slides? Could be quite useful for me right now. Um, okay. I'm not going to tell you what the make of the device is. Uh, it is actually on. Okay, it was a wrong device. Okay, let me go back. Okay, so um, the theme of applied machine learning is one where we hope that we design machines that are going to help humans. That's one of these stock photos you can find about the topic. I think the very general question of machine intelligence is also philosophically extremely intriguing because it sort of pushes the boundary of definition what it means to be a human being. I'll come back to this later because after all we are still uh, animals made out of flesh coming from biology probably with a fairly interesting neural network. Uh, but meanwhile we should think about why we design machines, what they should be useful for and usually we sort of say, it would be good if machines let us have fun and they do the hard work, right? And here you have the example how it could go wrong. And the world sometimes look a little, looks a little bit like this, with us running around like headless chicken and maybe, you know, the robot having a good time meanwhile. Now, coming back to the philosophy, we had recently uh, Stuart Russell, that many of you know, I think he does some very fundamental work about how to engineer AI algorithms that you can trust, that are designed so that they will actually satisfy constraints given by humans. That seems like the obvious thing to do, but you can engineer many, many examples where you can see how things could go wrong if a robot, let's say, obeys orders from one human in contradiction with expectations from another human. If the robot is extremely efficient, he or she okay, will actually maybe destroy the other human. And uh, this you know, is a scenario that you know from movies, you know from science fiction. The truth is that it's very hard to design um, robots 
uh, uh, machine intelligence or artificial intelligence systems that are guaranteed to fulfill, for example, the good for society. Because it poses questions which are much broader than optimizing, you know, a multidimensional functional uh, according to some cost function, because it involves very basic questions about what is the common good, what is the individual good, what does it mean to satisfy certain constraints, and uh, even the question of equality, right, how do you distribute something in an equal manner, which of course goes into a cost function, is actually a very hard question. Now, why we have applied machine learning days right here in Lausanne, of course, goes back to history. History is this, uh, Mary Shelley was actually vacationing on Lake Geneva, okay, so the birthplace of artificial intelligence, obviously is Lake Geneva. You know the story, she was, uh, there was a challenge among a group of people to write a horror story. She worked on it or tried to work on it for a long time uh, while having a good time on Lake Geneva. And then she had a dream. One night she had a dream, I would rather say a nightmare, and she came up with this, you know, fantastic story of Dr. Victor Frankenstein and his creature, uh, the creature, which is a humanoid robot, and the rest is history. Uh, it has been put into movies many times, but it poses some of the basic questions of when we as humans build machines that should emulate what we think humans should be or what artificial humans or humanoids should be. Now, Recently, I've been, become very interested in biology because, after all, uh, you know, machine learning is a great field of applied uh, mathematics, but, uh, you know, uh, evolutionary biology has also created us, right? And I still believe, and Bach is the proof, you know, humans can be quite uh, outstanding at certain tasks, especially creative tasks. And so, you know, it's worthwhile to go back and think about biology a little bit. And Okay, free advertising, okay. I just finished this book, How to Grow a Human. I don't know how many of you have read the book. Uh, it's really worthwhile reading. It's Philip Ball going into an experiment where he takes some cells, or some biologists take some cells, go back to stem cells, and grow a brain, right? And Philip Ball watches the brain, and the brain is a bunch of cells that start to multiply. After a while, the cells start to emit signals, you know. They sort of stop the experiment before you have sort of synchronous events in that bunch of cells. Because at that point, I think Philip Ball becomes very nervous that there is a second Philip Ball in, uh, in, in, you know, in, in vitro growing up. Now, these pose these questions, of course, what does it mean to be a human again? Because you can grow, grow brain cells of humans in a pig, for example. Not that uh, I would suggest you do it, but it can be done and has been done. You can grow all sorts of, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of, you know, multiply cells in other animals and so on. At the end, it is a very deep question what it means, how you should regulate and so on. And in some sense, what we do in machine learning and artificial intelligence is very much similar to this. It poses very fundamental ethical questions. Let me maybe skip this one because I'm taking too much time. Somebody who is very vocal about both the potential but also the risks of this merging of biology and computer science is uh, Yuval Harari, who was actually here at EPFL uh, six months ago, uh, giving a lecture, participating in a debate, and filling a room, uh, of course, of interested people. I think these merger questions between the most advanced algorithms that we can think of as computer scientists and uh, the possibilities of biology will uh, reach new frontiers that are very hard to predict. Except that the, uh, the origin, actually, of all this, the origin of robotics, the name itself, robot, comes from a science fiction novel uh, from the 20s. You probably know this, Karel Kapek wrote this, uh, um, this story of a factory where you were building robots. What I had forgotten is that the robots are not at all mechanical robots. The robots are actually made of pieces of cells put together with organoids into something which are humanoid robots. So at the origin of robotics wasn't a bunch of mechanical engineers, but the ideas actually came from biology. I, I think this is a good predictor of what we are going to see in the future. And I'm going to finish by simply saying, let's all work together that we don't build 
and also Frankenstein monster. Thank you for your attention.